Well, hello, hello, hello again, and welcome. Um, welcome to CEC Online uh, for our Bible teaching uh, service this evening. Our speaker this evening is Stephen McCoy. Stephen was with us last week and he started off talking about the armour of God. And so this week is part two of that. And for music this week, we have um, the Light Buddies. They are going to be singing to us. I will offer up my life and Jesus Christ, I think upon your sacrifice. And so let's just pray and we'll get on with our service. Our Father God, we thank you that we have the scriptures. We thank you that we have it in our own mother tongue and indeed in various translations of that. And Lord, we thank you for what your word can teach us. We thank you that it is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. Lord, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the teachings of Paul that we're going to be hearing something about tonight. And we pray, Lord, that you will bless what Stephen has to say to us, to our hearts. Touch us through your spirit this evening, we ask, and bless us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so over to the Light Buddies. once again and I want to turn again to Ephesians 6 and read those famous words in the Apostle Paul uh, that whole section about the armour of God and I'll begin again in verse 11 and read last week's verses as well as the ones I want to refer to this week. Paul says this, put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes for our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armour of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and having done everything to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. 
Last week I mentioned the fact that uh, we are living in the most unprecedented times. I've never lived through a period like this in all my 54 years. We have a virus for which apparently there is no immediate cure and tragically a, a lot of folk have died as a consequence. And because the virus is infectious, uh, radical moves have been taken for social isolation. And one of the big impacts of all of this is the church as we understand it just can't really happen anymore. Now, God willing, <coughs> all of that will change and we'll get back to normal church. But for now, uh, we just have to meet digitally. Now, I, I'm grateful for technology. And thank you to all the guys who work behind the scenes who make this possible. I'm aware of how much work there's involved <coughs> in putting together a program like this online. But it's not quite the same. It's great. It's a blessing. And, and churches have realize that this new digital mission field is to be exploited and people have become Christians online because of what churches in Scotland have been doing. Nevertheless, so much of our uh, accountability, so much of our fellowship, uh, so many of our good conversation together as Christians happen when we come together, when we can actually be together at church on a Sunday, in each other's homes, uh, during times of fellowship together. And that's now missing. And for all of us, I suspect it leaves us not just with a wee bit of a feeling of loneliness and isolation, but maybe also spiritually vulnerable. And so it's been particularly important during this time that all of us are spiritually vigilant, which is why I chose this passage. Now, last week we thought about the, the first two bits of this armour of God. We thought about truth and righteousness, which are if you like, the foundation stone upon which our Christian life is built. We believe that God is true. We believe the truth emanates from him. And as we engage with the world round about us, with all its uh, other world views, we stand on the truth as revealed by scripture, the truth that we know comes from God. And our righteous living, living Christ-like lives, is our other foundation, that fortification against what the devil would do. But the passage goes on to describe some other aspects of this um, spiritual PPE, this, this body armour that we can use, that we need to utilise. And the first of these comes in verse 15. It's, it's what I call the gospel boots. Paul talks about uh, feet that are fitted with the readiness that, that comes in the gospel of peace. Uh, soldiers always need good footwear. Uh, you can't possibly go into battle or even march towards a conflict zone unless you've got good footwear. I had uh, relatives who were in the armed forces and one of my uncles who was in a, in a regiment um, fought during the Falklands campaign. And he can remember marching right across the Falklands and he told me one time that the footwear that the soldiers were given wasn't all that brilliant and the enemy soldiers had better quality footwear. Uh, so often if they took enemy soldiers as hostages, they would swap shoes with them because their boots were better than the boots that our guys uh, were wearing in that particular conflict. Boots are massively important. Now the Roman army knew all of this and Roman soldiers were, were fitted with um, uh, a piece of footwork called the caliga. It was a very firm, strong uh, boot which had studs in the bottom and it was ideal for marching across all kinds of terrain. They could walk for many miles across mountains and everywhere else to get to a battle zone. And of course, in, in the thick of battle, when you're fighting in all kinds of conditions and sometimes maybe fighting in deep mud or slippery surfaces, having good footwear, which, which gives you a sense of assurance and security as you stand, it, it's massively important. A bit like Doc Martens with, with studs in the bottom. It was that kind of thing. Now, uh, this is feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And Paul is harking back to passages like Isaiah 52 verse 7. How beautiful on the, are the, on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. And it's the idea of a messenger who, who walks great distances with, with sturdy footwear to bring a good message to people. And the message here is the gospel of peace. And, and it's clear that Paul is talking here about evangelism, which, when you think about it, is a hugely appropriate image when he's talking about spiritual warfare. Because what do you think the devil fears more than anything else? 
well, I suspect it may well be, uh, Christians who are excited about their faith and who want to go into the devil's territory wherever there are people who, who are under the reign of the devil and, and, and proclaim the good news of Jesus. Because when Christians are, are, are equipped and motivated to share good news, that terrifies the devil. It, it eats into his kingdom. And, and that's the kind of idea that I think Paul is uh, talking about here. You remember I said last week that when we put this armour on, it's not just a physical discipline that we do, but there's a spiritual transaction that takes place here and God equips us as we take this armour on. And that might be comforting to some of you who, who might not feel that you're natural evangelists. Here's the point. Not everybody is a natural evangelist. I know that. But we are all called to be witnesses. And if we are determined just to speak well of Jesus, just to tell people about Jesus and the difference that Jesus makes in our lives, God gives us that supernatural power just to be able to be those witnesses for him and to be effective in communicating the, the, the good news of Jesus and to enthuse people about what God has done uh, in, in our lives. Uh, we don't do this alone. Remember when Jesus gave the Great Commission, he commanded his disciples to go into all the world and then he said, I am with you always. Every time we open our voices, uh, open our minds and, and, and let our voices go to, to share Jesus with people, Christ is there with us because he accompanies his witnesses. Now, of course, during lockdown, it's been really difficult to be witnesses for Jesus. Who do we speak to? We're, we're being socially isolated. But there have been opportunities. I had one not all that long ago um, when, when uh, one of my neighbours, I saw her uh, sweeping her, her, um, her driveway. This is just before lockdown. And I went and spoke to her and I said to her, isn't this bizarre, this whole COVID situation? And I spoke in that way because I knew that we suddenly have a whole nation that are aware of their mortality. They're aware that there's a, a virus out there for which there's no cure. They're aware we need to find some kind of answer here. And I thought it could lead to some kind of a spiritual conversation. And she said to me, the thing I'm missing the most from the closure of churches is I, I can no longer go to mass. And I told her that I was uh, doing preaching online and the churches that I was linked with were doing online services. And she was intrigued. A few weeks later, when we were out applauding the nurses that we've been doing on Thursday nights during lockdown, I saw her. And I had a little book by John Lennox about uh, where is God during a coronavirus crisis. And I went over to her. I didn't go anywhere near her. I stood at the very end of her driveway and uh, I said, I'm going to put a, a book on your doorstep and it's for you to read. That, that's all I said. But she thanked me, was grateful for it. And uh, I think she's read it. Just a small thing, but finding openings just to tell the good news. Now, as lockdown begins to uh, change and we get more and more uh, restrictions lifted and more and more freedom, why not take this opportunity? during a time when the whole nation is aware of their own mortality. Just be courageous. Put on those gospel boots. Go out of your way just to tell somebody about Jesus and what a difference Jesus has made in your life. Take that courage and see what God can do. Now, having talked about these gospel boots, Paul then goes on in verse 16 to talk about the, the shield of faith. Now, again, Roman soldiers relied very heavily on their shields. Uh, they weren't small shields that covered only part of their body. They were great big rectangular shaped shields that when they crouched down and linked up their shields and hid behind them, they covered most of their body and their shields could be linked up to form a kind of a, a, a wall which is almost impenetrable against the enemy. Uh, and it was a custom back in those days for uh, the, the enemy, the, the other army, to get their archers and they would dip the end of their arrowheads in pitch and send them set them alight and fire those arrows those flaming arrows towards uh, the Roman lines and as those arrows flew through the air um, it was a bit like when you've got a, a fire the embers of your fire and you're blowing it 
um, the flames suddenly light up. As those arrows are flying through the air, you can see those flames lighting up. And um, as they embedded themselves into the shield of, of a soldier, it may well have been tempting as he sees all these burning arrows stuck to his shield, embedded in his shield, to think, I I'm going to throw away the shield because it's on fire. But actually, uh, that would leave them very exposed then. They wouldn't have that full body protection. Uh, and what they did instead was to prepare for such an eventuality. They would take their large shields, they would dip them in water and soak them. So when those flaming arrows came across and embedded themselves in their shield, uh, because the, the leather in the shield was, was soaked, it would be sufficient to snuff out uh, the flames in those arrowheads. And they ended up doing no harm uh, whatsoever. So it was a tremendous defensive uh, mechanism. And Paul describes this as being a shield of faith. Faith, of course, is the essence of the Christian life. Without faith, it's impossible to please God because we must believe and believe all all kinds of stuff but here's a question i want to put to you uh, the devil does want to discourage us and he does want to fire flaming arrows at all of us as christians now what kind of arrows flaming arrows does he normally fire at us and during this lockdown period when we have experienced that aloneness that isolation and particularly for those of you who do literally live on your own and you've had that real isolation not even a family with you or friends with you during that time that's really tough what kind of arrows has the devil flung at us i find this particularly interesting because one of the big discussion points I've had pastorally with lots of people, and I, I get lots of phone calls, lots of emails from people who want to uh, to get in touch with me, and we we, we talk on the phone, we, we we zoom. A big issue has been mental health. We have lived under extraordinary circumstances, and lots of people feel the weight and the pressure of that, and it's very real. And of course, the devil loves that. He, he loves to uh, rain in our parade and, and, and make us feel bad, make us feel down, make us struggle. Because if he plays havoc with our emotions, with our thought life, um, and spiritually he plays with our minds, and he robs us of our confidence, he knows he can render us ineffective. So I'll ask you again. What kind of arrows has the devil been firing at you during this lockdown period? And what kind of arrows is he firing at you right now? It might be arrows of, of doubt, for example. Um, are, are you sure the Bible's true? I mean, you've been reading the Bible during this lockdown period to fortify yourself. Has it made a difference? Has it made you feel any better? Is, is faith in God rational at all? Do you really think that when you're feeling low, when you're struggling, that picking up your Bible or praying is going to make a difference? Are you really forgiven? Do you really have the strength to keep going? And those darts come back again and again and again. And they're followed up by um, arrows of fear. Have you ever known what it really is as a Christian to, to feel fear? I have. Actually, I, I had a moment of fear, actually more than a moment of fear today. And it led to a real sense of despair today. It's not uncommon, even in the life of a Christian. And that fear can begin to creep in and it's like it, it eats away at your soul. Are you sure God is with you in this crisis? And as it eats away and the future becomes more and more uncertain and you struggle with loneliness and you struggle with all those personal issues that crowd in and you struggle with the issue of your sin and you can't talk to anybody, not just because it might not be something that you want to be able to talk to somebody about, but because you're on your own. And you don't get a chance to meet up with people who you would normally have a chance to meet up with. And you just feel that sense of isolation and it's frightening, it's scary, and the devil knows it. And that fear takes a grip of you and it can lead to a sense of despair. And if it does so, you're defeated. 
and that bright, vibrant, excited Christian that you once were is now a, a fairly scared Christian. He's uncertain. He's lacking in confidence. He's full of self-questioning and, and is struggling. And I get that. I've, I've been there. And many of my Christian friends have been there too. God understands as well. God knows, which is why the Spirit of God inspired Paul to say, take up the shield of faith. Because when you have those moments of profound doubt and struggle and you're feeling fragile, that feeling of fragility can, it can just eat away, eat away at you. And the, um, the answer to that, the response to that is to say, I believe God. I trust God. I, I know that I can't get all my questions answered. I know that I'm having a bad week or a bad day today. I know I'm feeling fragile. I know I'm feeling lonely. I, I know it's a struggle. But God is here. God is here. And with God's help, in God's strength, filled with his spirit, I can be okay. So I'll take up that shield of faith and I'll believe God, even though the situation seems really, really difficult. Now you'll notice that directly afterwards in verse 17, Paul goes on to talk about the helmet of salvation, which I think is very, very closely linked to the shield of faith. Because after all, when the devil begins to attack us in, in the context of our faith and our belief system and how we're feeling right now in our spiritual lives, where does he, he really begin to attack? It's that sense of confidence that we have in our salvation. Now, Roman helmets were um, a solid piece of bronze. Sometimes it was just one piece of bronze that was hammered into shape and th that fitted uh, around the soldier's skull with, with, with kind of um, side pieces, cheek pieces in place to, to give further protection to the face. But it's obvious why you need a helmet. If you get a sword or, or a spear or an arrow uh, hitting you in the head, it's that thick piece of, of bronze armour, that solid piece that's going to protect you because inside your head is, is your brain, uh, the source of all your thought processes. And if it goes, boy, you're in trouble, real, real trouble. So it's vital. And this is the helmet of salvation. Now, it's no coincidence that the helmet covers your head, where your brain rests, where your thoughts emanate from. Our thought lives are really challenging. And our thought lives are so very important. And nothing will discourage us more as Christians than if we ever begin to question our salvation. Am I really saved? Do I really belong to God? Am I really his child? Has he really accepted me? Those are such fundamental questions that if we begin to experience doubt in that area, then we, we really will fall to pieces. And uh, the way Paul expressed himself here is very interesting because the helmet of salvation, um, we are being told to put this on or to remind ourselves that we are saved. This is our salvation. That's what we take with us into battle. The key issue in spiritual warfare, the key issue when the devil attacks us, the key issue when we feel under pressure is this fact that I'm saved. That no matter what else happens to me, however bad life gets, whatever crisis falls, even if my own health is affected, one of my close friends uh, got COVID-19. Now he survived, he's, he's still in recovery. He's uh, been out of hospital for some time now, but he still feels weak and washed out. But as I spoke to him on the phone and he tried to recount to me what it felt like, he, he told me that in his weakest, most desperate moments, his only sanctuary was to read to the Psalms and to remind himself that God is his salvation. Because he said to me, he said, I, I felt so awful, sore head, um, feeling all those symptoms, really struggling, no energy, 
feeling utterly, utterly terrible. And then, as you do, <laughs> listen to the news headlines and hearing all those tragic stories of all those lives that have been claimed by COVID-19, he said it was just unbearable absolutely unbearable because I knew I had this thing and this thing could happen to me. This could be the end. I might not see another week. That, that possibility was very real and he knew that possibility was very real. Thank God he's, he's very much recovering now, even though he's still washed out in very weak, weeks and weeks and weeks later. And reading the Psalms, and recognizing that God is his salvation. He's a child of God, he's saved, he's secure. No matter what happens, God is there and I'll never lose this. That was profoundly important for him. One of my favorite gospel singers from years ago was a guy called Larry Norman. And uh, one of his songs talked about all the things you could take away from him. And Larry Norman was a man who suffered lots of stuff in his life and he also died uh, relatively prematurely. But in this song, he said, you can take away all of these things from me, but you can never take away the Lord. I love that song. It means so much to me. And at times of despair, that's what should really hold us together. The helmet of salvation, whatever happens, I'm saved. I'm a child of God. Eternity is secure and be brave because we are God's children and nobody, not even the devil himself, nobody can pluck us out of God's hand. Finally, at the very end, verse 17, um, Paul talks about the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, earlier on, we thought about um, the, the belt of truth, the foundation of truth that we rely on. But notice all the armor so far that we've looked at is defensive in nature. A sword is not there for defence, it's there for attack. And Roman soldiers had a relatively short, very sturdy, very robust swords, uh, which were used for intense hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat. And they could do some damage. Wielded in the hands of a skillful soldier, they could do immense damage and could not just wound, but, but kill their enemies. And says Paul, this is the sword of the spirit, which is the, the word of God. The word of God has power. Now, here's something that I want us to think about. We as Christians often read scripture to each other, don't we? Now, of course we do, because we want to encourage each other with, with the word of God. So we read scripture to each other. How often do you read or quote scripture to your non-Christian friends? If you don't do it very often, I recommend you start doing it because the word of God has real power. Now, if we don't believe that and if we don't take the word of God seriously for ourselves, how on earth do we expect anybody else to take the word of God seriously? Uh, one of my friends down south who's an evangelist, he's in the habit of just stopping people, uh, people he's trying to witness to and relate to and just saying to them, let me give you a Bible. Why don't you have a go at reading it? And he'll give them recommended passages to read through. And it's because he believes that if, 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 if people who don't have any faith genuinely begin to start reading the Bible, it will transform their lives. He is convinced of the power of the word of God. Now, this is a challenge to me and I, I hope a challenge to you as well. Do you really believe the word of God has power? We thought last week that we live in a world of lots of ideas and false, um, false belief systems. The answer we know is God's word, but we need to learn to use it offensively and just get out there and, and quote scripture. Uh, one of my friends uh, here in, in Lanarkshire is, is, is a Gideon. And sometimes he and I will go out with his little Gideon Testaments and we'll just walk up and down Main Street and we'll stop people and say, uh, we're Christians, we believe the Bible. Do you have any concerns or worries in your life? Because we believe the Bible can speak into those situations and we stand there on the street reading verses to people in answer to their, their their worries and concerns. Now let's have confidence in the word of God. Next time you're in conversation, it may be with a Christian where you're having some kind of uh, challenge that, that, that both of you are facing and you're thinking through. 
it, it might be a non-Christian and you're deliberating about an ethical issue or, or, or some other kind of issue. Don't just talk to them. Bring in the word of God, learn scripture, quote it, use it. Its value is immense. I had that kind of a conversation recently. I was talking to somebody about the very sensitive issue of abortion. We had very different views on the issue of abortion. And I said, my big concern with this issue is, in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 26, I'm told we are made in the image of God, and that includes the unborn. And I quoted scripture. Scripture has power. In a world where day by day we're engaging in spiritual warfare, the offensive weapon that we have in every situation, in every conversation to use, is the word of God. So let's not be apologetic about it. Let's not shrink back from it. Let's believe it has power. And let's begin to use the word of God more regularly in our conversations with, with anybody who we're conversing with because this is spiritual warfare. This is our spiritual PPE. Our, our situation isn't going to change quickly or radically over the next little while. Um, church will continue to be like this online and we might not be able to enjoy full fellowship for some time. So in the meantime, put on the full armour of God and having done everything, keep standing. Keep uh, receiving strength from God in this spiritual battle. And God bless you. Have a great day. Thanks to uh, Stephen uh, again for his ministry to us. That was great these last two weeks. And thanks to, to the Light Buddies uh, for their music this evening as well. Enjoyed that too. So join us next week, 11.30am um, Sunday morning as usual. But for now, it's bye. For now. See you next week. 
Would you like prayer or pastoral care of some kind or practical help or just someone to talk to? Then contact us at cccomarnock at gmail.com. Now, if you're a female and would prefer to talk to a female, then just mention that when you contact us and we'll arrange that for you. cccomarnock at gmail.com.